Okay, here I am again doing another video. I'm doing this one ahead of time, so hopefully I anticipate all of the confusions that I need to address. Today we're going to be talking about Dulce e Decorum Est by Wilfred Owen. Um, definitely one of my personal favorites. Looks like it is now presenting. That's good to go. Okay. So first we're going to read the poem, and then I'll go back and just do a quick uh, situation analysis. This is not meant to replace classroom discussion, but it should be a start. Here we go. Dulce e decorum est, Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through the sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five-nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick, boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning, if in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulce e decorum est pro patria mori so my overly dramatic reading aside um really rather intense poem uh this this quote at the bottom in question one it mentions what it means but it was an old uh recruiting phrase slogan dolce e decorum est pro patria mori how sweet and decorous it is to die for your your country your fatherland so um i could give you all kinds of historical background on this but before we do we want to stay in the text what do we have i'll give a quick paraphrase um we've got the poem opens with a description of like soldiers and and what they look like you can uh, visually imagine this very vividly uh, his descriptions are very very detailed so bent double like old beggars under sacks you know their knees are knocking together they're coughing they're cursing through the sludge uh, there's haunting flares that are that they're turning their backs on the flares so while the flares are over here they're walking the other way uh, towards distant rest began to trudge so we get the sense that these are soldiers um, turning their back on flares on a battlefield and they are retreating to go to a a rest right so they're they're leaving the front to go towards um, towards camp somewhere uh, and then description of them they marched to sleep they lost their boots they limped they were um, you know bloodshot um, all went lame all blind and they were drunk with fatigue so um, <clears throat> some intense descriptions there and then deaf even to the hoots of tired outstripped five nines that dropped behind if you look that up those are those bombs that sound uh, like a whistle kind of like what has become cliche in, in movies and cartoons where you hear a whistle coming down um, so if you know what a five nine is um, he's giving us a hint of the uh, setting of the poem so that this is uh, world war one using those five nines um, and this is where I can bring in some of that historical background. Wilfred Owen was a World War I soldier. So he's saying that these soldiers that are marching towards retreat are deaf even to the bombs that are, you know, shrieking behind them with that, with that harsh whistling sound. They just don't even care. They just keep going. Then there's a new stanza, stanza break. And he says, gas, gas, quick, boys. And it's interesting how he does that. It's not a description. It's a declaration. It's, he pulls something right out of the, uh, the scene and just plops it in there. And then he gets back into his description. 
an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, uh, someone still yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. So you imagine there was a, a, a gas bomb that went off and it's starting to cover the field. And so they have to very quickly put on their gas gear um, and someone didn't make it. Um, someone, one of the soldiers was still there and, um, you know, had gotten caught up in the in the gas cloud and he was floundering around around like a man on fire or in lime so he's like burning and if you know um, anything about the gas that was used in gas attacks in world war one um, it was pretty horrific stuff um yeah and i'll get into some of those well wilfred owen gets into some of those details so then it describes dim through the misty panes you imagine that the speaker is looking out through their gas mask these kind of misty green panes of of plastic or glass um as if under a green sea i saw him drowning so he's playing around with that idea of um oh you know <laughs> uh looking out through these panes in a um in a gas mask as if it's a sea and then imagining that this guy is drowning in it. Now, what was literally happening to his body would have been very similar to drowning as uh, the gas that was used in World War I would um, uh, disintegrate your lungs, kind of like acid. So the way that you died was actually drowning on, in yourself. Rather graphic. Um, and then he gets to kind of the turn here. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. So he imagines this in his dreams. Um, if in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon. Okay. So he's addressing somebody here. Um, behind the wagon that we flung him in and watched the white eyes. So he describes um, what happens, right? And what he dreams about. He doesn't just dream about this guy dying. He dreams about what happened afterwards where they picked up the body and just flung him into a wagon and then having to march along behind that wagon and watching the white eyes of his, you know, writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin, that repetition of, of face, you know, really keys us in that the speaker is really, uh, that is the image that is stuck, seared into his memory. And then he says again, if you could hear, so if you could see this thing that I see every day in my dreams, if you could hear what I heard at every jolt, imagine they're at a, you know, they're on a battlefield and there's lots of little bumps and potholes. And so this wagon is bouncing. And with every bounce, what happened? The blood come gargling from the froth, corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile, incurable swords on innocent tongues. Ugh. And he describes very vividly what he saw and heard as this man, you know, freshly dead from the gas, his body on, at every bounce with a little bit more of that disintegrated insides coming out and being squeezed out at every little bump. So he says, if you could see this, if you could hear this, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie. Dolce de Corn Vesper Patria Moria, or poor poor patria mori and i'm probably mispronouncing that my latin is just amateur at best but um so here he gets to the point there's this big turn at the end where he says like look if you knew the realities of this war you would not go around telling these kids who are desperate for glory and warfare this lie that it is sweet and honorable to die for your country Right. If you could do, if you were there and if you saw it, you wouldn't exactly go back and start recruiting people. Hey, go fight for your country because the reality of it is when you fight and die for your country, this, this is what it looks like. It is incurable. It is uh, obscene as cancer, you know, and all these other things that he uses to describe it. So that's me kind of just kind of going over the poem and trying to, uh, pull out some of the uh, the information to make it a little easier to get at um, it's all there but you know maybe if you're still struggling with poetry uh, hopefully that helps so now we can start to do our sift analysis and i'm not going to do um, an entire sift i'm just going to do the situation because that's what we're dealing with this week and the question is what is the topic? We'll actually come back to that in a second. I'm going to put that on hold because this one is not as clear as maybe Sonnet 29 was. This one's a little bit more difficult. Um, but we do have a speed 
speaker and an audience that is uh, a lot more clear. So let's start with the speaker. That one's really straightforward. We know that, uh, you know, this was a soldier. We could even name it as being a World War I soldier. I don't know which side the soldier is on. Of course, I can make an inference based on the poet, but again, we're trying to leave the poet out of it, right? Wilfred Owen is over there on the shore, and we're out in the middle of the ocean waving to him. Um, so we could say that the speaker is a World War I soldier um, who has witnessed, you know, infantrymen. Maybe we could even say that specifically. They have witnessed the fighting at the front, and that's the important part. So we've got a frontline fighting World War I soldier. Now, to whom is he speaking? Well, and that really comes in with that third stanza. I'm going to zoom way in on it so we can focus on it. And here we go. He addresses you. He addresses you again. Well, who is you? Well, we know that he refers to him as my friend. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're friends. Uh, John McCain was fond of using that term, my friend, to refer to whomever he was speaking to. So we can't necessarily draw any conclusions that they were friends. But it would be an interesting idea to play around with. Perhaps he is speaking to a friend of his who is not a soldier. Um, you know, it's uh, I identify with this idea because some of my friends... Uh, like to tell me what I know or don't know about teaching, but they've never taught a day in their life. So I would refer the, to them in the same way with the same kind of tone where I say, if you could see what the students do, you would not tell anyone with such high zest. You should become a teacher. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I digress. Back to the poem. So you would not tell with such high zest. So he's speaking to somebody that does tell others this old lie, this uh, recruitment slogan. So whoever he is speaking to, whether it be a congressman or maybe a recruiter or maybe some sort of politician or anybody, you could just be a civilian that just says, you know, yes, you should join up and fight. It is sweet and decorous to die for your country. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of reasons to go and fight and die for your country. But maybe let's not tell people that it is sweet and honorable because the death you die in warfare is not necessarily honorable. Okay, uh, as he describes with this guy who died just because he couldn't get his gas mask on fast enough. Okay, so that's what we have. We have a speaker who has a very clear kind of relationship to his audience. And his audience is not necessarily a specific person, but maybe all people who encourage people to join up and fight using this old lie. Right. Um, I met a recruiter once who convinced me you don't have to lie to people to get them to join the army. You can you can find other other ways. And I think Wilfred Owen is keying in on that. OK, so we've got the role in the audience and, and the purpose is very clear right here. It's basically saying stop lying to these kids. And this is a lie. It is not sweet and decorous and honorable to die for your country. Um, the reality of it is just too grotesque and obscene. Okay, so now we arrive at the topic, and this is where we get to start to do some interpretation. Okay, so the topic is either could be the uh, the old the recruiting slogan. We could say that that's the topic. Could be uh, the memory that the speaker has of. Uh, this guy dying and then walking behind him, but it seems to be something much larger than that, right? It's it's both his memory of warfare and this old lie, Dolce Decorum Est, right? So how we phrase that, if we were to write an analysis of this poem, if we were to write an essay about this poem, um, we would want to tread carefully because uh, we want to make sure that we know what we are what kind of claims we're making about this poem um, and what the poem is saying, because what the poem is saying is so much bigger than any one topic. Um, some incorrect readings would be to say that this is a poem about World War I. It is not about a specific battle. It is not about a specific war. It definitely is about something bigger than that. So there's a, there's a certain range of responses we could come up with for what the topic is. Um, 
and we can pull from different points in the text to justify those responses. Coming, hammering that down is, is the work of our class, and we're going to do that in class together. So I hope that helps you understand Dolce de Coram S. Propatria More by Wilfred Owen, um, one of my uh, more favorite poems. I'm a big fan of his poetry. Uh, very descriptive, very intense poetry. So enjoy. Again, text me questions. And if you have uh, need any assistance, just let me know. I will see you on the next one. Bye.